right, you little piglets. Gather around and suck oink, all oink. at our teats. Uh, <laughs> uh, talking, of course, about our podcasting teats. Uh, thank you for clarifying. Um, yeah, yeah, it's yes, not gross we, that way. We are, we are doing some definitive teat suckling this week on film franchise Fortnite on the Cold Popshire podcast. I'm AJ, recording this from my new apartment. A little understated... Uh, storyline of the last few months of the pod- podcast was me looking for an apartment. Mm. Finally found one. And Richard, what do you think from what you can see of it on the Zoom call? Uh, from what I can see of it on the Zoom call, mm. it looks you look like you're in a hotel room. <laughs> yeah, it feels a little bit like a hotel room. I'm in a I'm in a um, very cool city apartment that uh, would overlook the city if there wasn't another city apartment building yeah. directly outside it. So I've got to sort of like stand and like skirt my head over the edge of the balcony <laughs> by a couple of inches to get a good city view. But I also feel like that's a very AJ core yeah, compromise yeah. for you know. I have a view technically. Are there any? Do you have any? Possibly any um, beautiful uh, neighbors who live across the way and you can peek into their apartment. And it's not not like in a pervy way, just like in a, you know, uh, a romantic way. Yeah, I'm peeking at my neighbors romantically. They don't know it, but it's it's yeah, 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 romantic yeah. because Richard, Richard, I'm a bloody dog. I'm a bloody pig, and I'm in the city, Richard, and I'm not the only one this week on film franchise Fortnite's <laughs> uh, two film two franchise because we are going to be covering, discussing, talking about the two films in the Babe series, Babe and Babe Pig in the City. My letterbox review was very nearly you and me both, brother. But I didn't think people, I didn't think me moving into the apartment Pe- was enough. People wouldn't be able to infer that you're in the city. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the the very clever wordplay would have been lost. So. <laughs> Before we get into the episode today, I do just want to let people know that I guest starred on a the the second most recent episode of Do Go On, where I talked about the uh, process of getting a Dune film made. So if you enjoyed our episode last fortnight with Matt Stewart, and you'd like to hear me and Matt and Jess Perkins and Dave Warnicky, uh talk about something else here on over to do go on and listen to the dune the unfilmable novel episode i put together a little report and told them all about dune jodorowsky's dune sorry hodorowsky's dune um david lynch's dune denny villeneuve's dune we talked about it and it was a lot of fun and i'd love for people to go listen to it if you weren't aware of it already uh okay thank you richard uh, yeah, so two films. First one came out in 1995, uh, followed in 1998. And yeah, first film. Let's uh, dive right into it like a, a pig suckling at their mother's teat. and Or or a trough, a pig eating gruel eating out of a slop out, out of a, of a trough. trough. Yeah, yeah, gather slop around our... Slop is the word I was looking gather for. Gather around our trough and get your slop on. Uh, it's time mm. to podcast. Yeah, directed by Chris Noonan. <laughs> Uh, do you recognize mm. the name Chris Noonan? Is Chris Noonan an actor or am I thinking of someone else? I think you're thinking of someone else and I know who you're thinking of. I'm thinking of Tom Noonan. Yeah. yeah. Tom Noonan. Or you might yeah. be thinking of <laughs> and his brother. We're, this is not the first time we've mentioned Noonan on this podcast and we have to bleep it because he's not a celebrity. He's just a person we know and you guys have as much information that his surname's Noonan as well. We can't bleep the whole thing because the whole point of going on this tangent was the surname so uh, yeah but sorry if you're being doxxed by us. <laughs> but other than that do you recognize the name chris noon in any of his other films or anything i don't think so i don't think so no, he's only made one other film uh miss potter yeah <laughs> oh yeah that doesn't sound very familiar it's that um, you recognize and- the poster it's like it's just like renee zellweger in like a period oh. outfit going like hmm yeah, yeah, it's about the woman who wrote yeah, Beatrix uh, Peter Rabbit. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, no, well, according to the very little I know about the behind the scenes of this film as well, he probably didn't even direct this one either. So uh you know, he's only directed one film about farm animals. <laughs> <laughs> Were you a big Beatrix Potter guy? 
Uh, no, not really. I think I was very into rabbits when I was a little kid. That they were my favorite animal. But I think the sheer boringness of the Peter Rabbit illustrations right. overrode any interest I had in cute bunny rabbits. Yeah, yeah. I uh, a Brer Rabbit, and then James Corden did not help when he showed up on the scene yeah. to revitalize the franchise. Yeah, I was into Brer Rabbit. Mm. You into Brer Rabbit? How is it? No idea who that is. Heard oh. the name though. Yeah, he was great. Anyway, so the yeah, we'll we'll get into some behind the scenes stuff uh, in a moment. But yeah, it was written uh, by Noonan and George Miller, who we've covered a couple of times on this podcast before. He directed all four Mad Max films, and he also a lot more in line with this directed both uh, Happy Feet films. <laughs> A true testament to not being put in a box as a director, mm. I think, George Miller. I reckon he's one of the most high-profile directors whose filmography varies wildly in tone and, mm. uh, you know, like like every, even the, the R-rated Spielberg films and the G-rated Spielberg films still feel like Spielberg. Yeah, they got that magic. Um, I think there is still a, yeah. a, a Malarian quality to his films mm, though absolutely. It's been more, absolutely more than anything his camera work like even you know shit yeah. like Witches of Eastwick and stuff you get a Lorenzo's Oil um, mm. yeah yeah. Big I Lorenzo actually haven't Zoyle. seen either of those I've only seen his franchise films wow yeah I <laughs> I didn't I, even see A Thousand Years of Longing yeah which I was I'd so excited for that and then I, I was in the States when it came out and then I just ended up seeing it anywho <laughs> yeah the, the film's based on a novel uh, and uh, yeah Fans of our intern Rachel will be happy to know that we did uh, renew her contract for uh, this year, and so yeah, they have sent me through a a list of differences between the book and the film, which we'll get to in a moment. However, fans of our um, our other intern Vincent, who would play video games and review uh, tie-in video games, uh, his contract was not renewed because. Uh, we cancelled the show that he would do that for. <laughs> don't know <laughs> is, what are there about. babe video games? There is. Uh, I was going to get to it at the end, but there is a universally panned Babe Pig in the City game from 2006. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Universally panned. Uh, the book was Great called stuff. The Sheep Pig. Uh, if you're in the US, you might know it as Babe the Gallant Pig, which is what it was called there. Oh, are these none of these are doing it for me. Yeah, yeah. Sheep pig, I can understand, but babe, I guess maybe it's because I've grown up with knowing the mm. films called Babe, like just feels irreplaceable to me. Mm. What is Babe about, AJ? Well, it's about a gallant sheep pig, Richard. I'm so <laughs> glad you've asked. No, no, Babe is is set on what they're trying to sell as like a what a quaint American. Is it American or English? Uh, yeah, I'd say because it's really Australian. I know yeah, that much. New South Wales, yeah. <laughs> they, they've done their best to dress up um, Australia as some kind of country town in possibly England or America. It, I would have said England if I hadn't watched the film, but watching it, everyone like there's a lot of American accents going on. Yeah, so well, there's also maybe supposed like, to be. I think uh, we'll get to this when we get to the second film, but I think it's intentionally uh amb- uh ambiguous where it is especially you know when we get to the mm, city that's true we'll that's, discuss that's what true. city it is in a moment uh because normally you'd go the, oh well he goes to, to the city but anyway mm. AJ, i'm so yep. sorry to interrupt so, you please continue no so don't let good. me interrupt so we, you again. we don't let okay. me interrupt you At, i'm trying just keep I'm going trying just so keep hard going. We lay our scene in Fair Hoggett Farm, where James Cromwell plays a farmer named Hoggett, and he's got a wife um, who's played by the lady from Kath and Kim, who's about 20 years Mega older. Savinsky. Yeah, her. She's about 20 years older in this than she was in real life, by the looks of it. They, yeah, she was like 33 in the film. Mm, there you go. Well, she looks about 63 in mm, the film. So which is 20 years, years older, yeah. <laughs> um and uh yeah she the this farm uh they're 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 a sheep farm and one day they get a pig that they a little piglet that they plan to cook up for um their 
the Christmas dinner at the end of the year. Uh, but the pig shows a penchant for sheep dogging, mm-hmm. <laughs> for herding sheep. For dogging um, the sheep. And is quite good at it. Yep, and um, so the farmer decides to actually invest in this sheep and train it to be a really good sheep dog. Um, that's pretty much the film. It's very quaint. Oh, by the way, the animals can speak, mm. but only two other animals. They can't speak. The humans can't understand. It's always interesting to see what rules will this talking animal movie go by. Mm. And this is the type of talking animal genre where every animal that's not a human can understand each other. They speak some kind of universal language cross species, but the humans just hear oinking and barking mm. and grunting yeah it is it, this film is kind of credited with kicking off the cgi talking animal uh craze because it was quite well received do you want to take a guess as to what it has on rotten tomatoes i'm thinking like 85 percent on rotten tomatoes no you you dumb fuck it's actually 97 percent very high for a for a movie. Had you seen this before? I'd never seen Bo before, no. So I thought I would have thought I had, but watching it, I was like, oh, I reckon this was like the Colgate Saturday Night feature once or twice when I was a kid, and I remember that'll do, pig. And I that's just one like of those things that's just seeped into. You know, I've just picked out it from pop culture osmosis. It's just yeah, seeped yeah. into the public consciousness. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like surprisingly for this kind of film so this was like just a nice family film you would think you know nothing nothing necessarily to write home about but yeah it was beloved it was nominated for seven academy awards uh Mm. It, uh, it won best visual effects it was also nominated mm-hmm. for best editing art direction adapted screenplay supporting actor director and best picture and this was back in 1995 where there were only five best picture nominees i i'll actually i'll pull up um what it was up against yeah so isn't this a, this is the least this is the i i found out this was nominated for best picture a couple of weeks back mm. and i was like is this like the most um appropriate for all ages movie to have ever been nominated for best picture yeah like I, this is this i wouldn't say it's squeaky clean there's a bit of like like it deals with death but it deals with death in a very mature and like uh a way that that i don't think would be too outside the realms of what you've what kids probably already know about mm. death but this this movie's like this is such a a a um dark horse for for uh best picture i think what was it up against uh so it was up against it lost to braveheart it was up against apollo mm-hmm. 13 okay. il postino and sense and sensibility some other films from that year uh leaving las vegas um bridges of madison county usual suspects leaving las vegas didn't get nominated for best picture. toy story as well well there was only five nominees at the time so but that that's even more surprising because this feels like the kind of film that gets nominated for best picture because you've extended it yeah exactly yeah yeah. not but but i also wonder though if this is actually a a situation where like um uh like the the we are underestimating the the cultural phenomenon that Babe would have been yeah, in '95, yeah, yeah, right? Like this would have been '95's Barbie, right? Like this <laughs> this really bright, exciting, interesting, must see film that, in the case of Babe, it, it had this groundbreaking special effects in it. Yeah. Like this is this is like a best picture nomination that feels like it's acknowledging that something that new has moved been the added forward. to the film. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I looked to compare like that seven Oscar mark, um, nomination mark. Uh, you know, that's equivalent mm-hmm. to Maestro this year or The Fablemans last year. Right, yeah. I'd say it's, so, I'd put it in the know. same. And, and actually, interestingly, Belfast the year before. So the last three years of like director vanity projects, um, all get mm. seven nominations. <laughs> Amazing. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Like, like 
What did you think of of Babe? I watched Babe in two halves, and it was one of those films that I think uh, really won me over in the second part that I watched it. Um, because mm-hmm. the first half, I was like, "Yep, yeah, talking animals." Haven't fucking seen that before, and it's very vignette-y. Like it's very yeah. like fade to black. The mice come up. They introduce the next story and it feels like um what i was to understand the Stuart little book was like right yeah yeah, yeah. you know like yeah. just sort of independent they episodes. wanted to keep it that sort of storybook feel and the the mice popping up to tell you the name of the chapter is because in test screenings mm. george miller noticed that kids were having to be like what does it say what does it say Mm, um, mm. And then, so they add, also, they add unintelligible fucking mice. But also, yeah, I, you might be about to say this, but on my <laughs> screen, on on Amazon Prime, did yours just not have the words? I think it did have the words. I wasn't about to say that. I was about to say were they that- in black because yeah, that that like it didn't have a heading. It just had the mice saying it in the second oh, one. I don't, I don't remember. Um, but I do, I can tell you that um, I, some months ago, edited a video for Letterbox that was the guys that directed Talk To Me interviewing George Miller. Mm. Um, and he said that, I might be paraphrasing or misremembering it exactly. Apparently this was a mess in the edit mm. and that George Miller's wife was the one that said, what about these mice? Like, what if they segment it? And that's one of these, like, that saved the film right, yeah, kind same. of. And I think she still edits for him. Mm. Like, I think she's still his main editor. So not that not that he directed this. Let's be very clear. <laughs> this was Chris Noonan's film. Yeah, so there, there, as you alluded to earlier, there's a little bit of controversy. Um, actually, no, you know what? I'm going to finish talking about what I thought of the film first. Because, uh, the, yeah, so, so the first half of the film was a bit like, Eh, you know, whatever. Um, it's nice. Um, best picture, okay. And then when we get to the sheepdog trial at the end, and spoilers for Babe, Babe wins the trial by being nice oh and kind because it's like the whole thing is like it's a universally regarded truth that sheep are stupid and the dogs have to come in and just bark the shit out of them to get them to do anything and bite but, at them and nip them yeah and babe just says babe gets the password uh that's like a secret sheep password um because the sheep want to help babe and it's this all like it's it's you know it's that that sort of very what's now very uh in vogue thing of like solving problems with kindness you know that we've seen you know, the mm. good place ted lasso that it's like it's the hot thing in comedy right now and mm. When he actually does the trial, the the score completely drops out. There's no music in the scene. Mm. You can hear a pin drop um, because the whole thing is, you know, he, he's bringing a pig out to a sheepdog trial. And he's the laughing stock of the entire country of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And everyone's going up, yeah. and then as soon as Babe actually starts doing it, yeah, the music drops, the entire crowd is completely silent, and then it's like, part of the trial is like, you have to get six sheep into the circle, and then you take like three of them out, so you divide them, so it you know, shows real control. And then he does it in like record time, and as soon as he's done, the crowd just fucking erupts, goes insane mm. from being like completely deathly silent. And then... Of course, the the iconic line where uh, Babe goes and stands by the farmer's side and says, and he says, "That'll do, pig. That'll do." Mm. And That's yeah, right. it's it's one of these like I've never really understood that line, and I and I'm kind of still don't like. I, I I get that it's like he's a very closed off character, and and I guess it's just his way of saying good job, you know. Um, mm. because that'll yeah. do is like not a very encouraging thing to say to someone, but I guess. Within the context of the he, character, it's that's the whole point. He's got that Cromwellian warmth that uh, can turn anything into a a, a loving yeah uh, line. I think, and yeah, so it's um, it's great. We've had this a few times on the podcast, but like when you see an iconic moment and you're like, "Yes, I get this now. This is why it's iconic." Yeah, nice, nice. I think that um, one of the things I loved about, but I gave this five stars. Was so not expecting I. to, but gave gave five stars on Letterbox, um, and I think that what I loved about it is that um, not only does it like is it broadly dealing with like bigotry i guess like mm. your assumptions about another group of 
people, quote unquote. And you know, there's this really oh, clear you don't bit see them as people, say, AJ. That's <laughs> pretty fucking racist. There's this, really, <laughs> there's this really clever bit where where they say the thing you said before that like every it's a universally regarded fact that sheep are stupid, um, and that's why the dog was talking slowly to the sheep to try and save Babe. But then it, then when the sheep talked to the dog, it was like it's a universally regarded fact that what was it? Dogs have dogs don't listen or something yeah, like yeah. that like so it's like this it goes the same way and they come to an understanding so not only does it tackle bigotry in like a quaint old timey way that just like points out how stupid it is to and and how bogged down and how of of a roadblock bigotry can be in solving a problem mm. right but I also really liked that it follows this thread where it, where it doesn't shy away from the fact that like humans eat animals mm. and nowhere in the like like I always felt like in the Lion King right where they're like oh no when we eat the antelope they return to the grass and then we then they eat the grass well, and then when we die we return to the grass and they eat the yeah. grass so it's the circle of life and it's like oh great Mufasa of course you would say that as the one that gets to to kill the antelope <laughs> and eat them you'd be like yeah don't worry antelope we'll die and then your ancestors will eat the grass it's like yeah well so Someone's getting a raw deal in that. I always, yeah, I always felt like that. That that was like such a, um, a, a privileged way to put it when you're the the predator. But in Babe, they don't shy away from that. And when Babe finds out that he was initially supposed to be eaten, it's heartbreaking. And like, this is a. I I felt this was like a pro vegetarian film. Because at no point does it ever justify eating other animals. Yep. I guess in real life, animals aren't as like cogent as they are in the universe. Well, apparently of so. Babe. Apparently so. But you know, like it wasn't. It wasn't a movie that that tried to have its cake and eat it too by saying like we'll we'll brush over the fact yeah, yeah. that a lot of these animals get eaten by humans it's like nope let's deal with it let's tell kids about it and let's not really offer like a satisfying conclusion to it beyond just acceptance that that's the way the world is like <laughs> yeah i, I think like great. um uh george miller's a vegetarian and mm -hmm. uh james cromwell was a vegetarian and became vegan because he's of starring in this film and essentially was like, wow. I can't ethically be in this film and still eat animal products. And it, apparently mm. pork sales in the U S dropped by 20% after the movie came out. And it's had, mm. had a market effect on the growth of vegetarianism. Apparently. That's awesome. And good, good, like good. It should have, because like I'm a vegetarian at all, but my um, willpower only. I think yeah. um, at the, at this stage of my life, and um, just to be clear, just to be clear, I'm not a vegetarian. I but I would like to be. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Like so I, I get... yeah, I, I love animals so much that I'm like I, I actually just it's one of those things that you know um, if if a vegan or a vegetarian stopped me and questioned me on on it, it's like I there is no reason I can give you. It's been, like to I'm justify just to person. you or to myself. Yeah, I'm just a shitty person. Yeah, with, yeah. Um, yeah, with shitty taste buds. But it's like I, 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 I have to have that cognitive dissonance because mm. I, I, I find every animal so cute that it's like I, I'm not even like, yeah. Oh well, you know, there's a difference between like cats and dogs and a cow or something. Like I, I find cows adorable. I used to go at one at my old flat. There was, especially during COVID, there was like um, this uh, this park, Cromwell, Cromwell Park um, in Auckland. Oh, I think Cromwell Park. Yeah. Well, well, well. Uh, <laughs> Any relation? Um, that would, and they would have just like cows and quite often sheep like roaming around there. And I would always like so excitedly take photos of heaps of them. They would like come right up to you. And it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you're in their space, so be careful. But I would like hang out with the cows and like, I think chickens are cute. I think ducks are fucking cute. I, I would love a pet duck, but my two cats, I think, would um, probably not not love that but yeah it's um i think they would love it you just wouldn't have a pet duck for, for, too for very long after. yeah but there is um my sort of um that side of my beliefs 
does eat into my feelings about the second film and we'll we'll get to that i'm sure but um yeah well i i would say as well like pigs especially and babe obviously being a pig who voices babe uh it's tommy pickles right in the second film it's tommy pickles and the first film it's ah. Susie carmichael that's right it is too uh just the cu- and the cu- the cutest voice so so well um Chris- characterized Christine but the on- actress's name Yes, that's right. But on top of that, like pigs of all the animals we do eat, pigs are the ones that need to be pushed into the cats and dogs bracket Mm -hmm. of do not eat more. Like, I hate to put a value on it, and maybe that's also like a very short-sighted thing to say, but like pigs are are, um, intelligent and- They can herd sheep. And like, they can herd sheep. Have you seen They orgasm for 30 minutes. (laughs) <laughs> what kind of creature would be is not you know if, if they're orgasming for 30 minutes that that is the sure sign of intelligence mm. yeah the yeah they're, they're also yeah they're also they're, they're just cute man pigs are cute they exactly, they, oh, they grow exactly. fucking fast there were 48 piglets used um for babe because they grow oh my so fast. god um Oh, of course. Yeah. There 48. Was, yeah. Holy shit. There was a pub wow. quiz question um, at a quiz Jess was at recently. This And um, it was like, which 1995 film had 50 of its extras die within a year of the film's release? Oh, that's such a depressing way to put it. Yeah. But it's like, well, they're animals. So that, you know, a lot of them have short lifespans um, and also, you know, would have been oh. killed for meat. Ah, oh, right. Not just the pigs, then. It's not just the forty-eight pigs. No, no. Though. It's it's yeah. It's it's I thought, like I get what you mean. I thought you were meaning like the forty-eight pigs were all slaughtered after, the, which <laughs> is like George Miller. Surely you could have done something. Uh, about, yeah, sorry, yeah. T- sorry, sorry. Chris Noonan. Surely <laughs> you could have done something about this. Um, I my favorite aspect of Babe the film was James Cromwell, Mm. was Farmer Hoggett. I thought he was such... Like, I knew that'll do, Pig. I knew it was James Cromwell. But I did not know how layered and complex this character was before Mm. watching it here. Because he is so reserved and keeps his feelings so close to his chest that when that things like that'll do pig or similar moments throughout the film, they just, it feels like the equivalent of him like bursting into tears, pouring his heart out because Mm. it's so... It's it, it's like that's how he knows, that's how capable he is of showing his emotions. And there's this one bit in the film where Babe has been out all night after he heard after he discovered that he was supposed to be eaten. And he's got a cold and Hoggett has got to like heal him up and get him drinking fluid so that he can still do the sheepdogging um, competition. Um, and he does it. He slowly like starts singing to him. And what do you, do you have the name of the song? Because it's the score for the film as well. Yeah, uh, I can pull it up for you one second. If I had words, I think. It's yeah. If 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 I had words, da, 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 da. and he sings that, and then he gets up and starts dancing, and all the animals like turn and watch him, and he feels a little bit embarrassed, feels a little bit sheepish after that, Richard. And and what mm, I loved feels is a like a little bit dogged. <laughs> so much of this character is like left for you to decipher and it's like what that scene tells you when he does this like irish jig to this wonderful wonderful song um it it t- t- it spoke to me because it's like he would not do this in front of humans he wouldn't even do this in front of his his wife like the, the babe means so more pig as he calls him means so much to him that that's who he's willing to be as true self isn't that beautiful <laughs> isn't that like isn't that such beautiful character writing and performance like i didn't know that that was hidden in babe mm. i didn't know that there was this this beautiful human story that's like very much secondary to the wacky talking duck and the evil cat <laughs> like mm. you know like oh by the way this this really touching depiction of like sort of like a masculine character who grew up in a in a in a time where he would have been taught to not display his emotions finding a way to i'm choking up talking about i thought it was really touching uh, a really touching portrayal well, I mean, he was character. nominated for an oscar for it for the supporting actor and he should have been yeah, yeah yeah well he was so great well i'm happy then yeah good um but he originally didn't want to do the role um well, George, really? George Miller wanted an Australian um, 
uh, yeah, I guess because, you know, and Mega Sabansky is an Australian, um, so would have maybe been doing an accent, but I guess he just wanted to support local talent. But uh, yeah, it was um, Noonan, I was going to say Tom Noonan, uh, it was Noonan who insisted on him. Uh, but yeah, James Cromwell didn't want the role originally because uh, he looked at the script and was like, this guy has 16 lines. Uh, the farmer says right, so- a total of 171 <laughs> words across the film. Um so the, the very thing I'm praising him for, he just didn't get off yeah, the yeah. bat. He was just like, eh. yeah. But, <laughs> but he said so that, you funny. know, and then um, like after looking into it more, was like, oh, I'm in every scene. I just don't speak a lot, mm. you know. Um, mm, mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, he was also, he was convinced by a friend who essentially said, look, you go to Australia, you have a little holiday, you make a picture. If the film fails, no one's blaming you. They're going to blame the pig. <laughs> And so he was like, yeah, I guess, all right. Not I'll only do am it. I not blaming the pig, I'm actually spotlighting him as the best part of the of this groundbreaking visual effects masterpiece, this <laughs> touching film about like animals. I'm saying, no, no, the, the, the animal that I was most drawn to, the human. Wow. <laughs> the one that you want to. I just eat. found him more relatable. Yeah, yeah. I love how dark the film gets as well. We talked about this before, but like. How dark the film gets. Yeah, there's one of them's a main how character. How dark it gets. Uh, how, there's a, like a matriarchal sheep called Ma that is uh, sort of takes Babe under her wing and Ma is killed when a bunch of dogs of evil dogs break into the farm and there's this bit where they're all crowded around the dead body of Ma and Babe starts going Ma! 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 <laughs> and the camera like pans up like in like a, um, a bird's eye view of, of this pig like crying to the heavens and the obviously the joke the dark joke here is that it's the sound a sheep makes and all the sheep are crying and bleating with them like this is fucking um you're tearing me apart lisa what's that guy's name <laughs> Tommy not Wiseau. Tommy Wiseau, the, the, the original one james james De- that's a james dean like you know like that's that's what that reminded me of or or, or um Marlon Brando yelling Stella and yeah, yeah. and streetcar named Desire like like obviously it's evoking similar imagery and it's yeah, probably yeah, yeah. directly or like um, or like Darth ways. Vader going no and return of uh, Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, man, like it's it's just it's a it's a <laughs> it's genuine moment yeah. of 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 drama mm. where this happens plenty in the film and this is why it's so good but in that moment specifically it doesn't matter that it's one of 48 pigs that's got its mouth cgi'd to mm. move and speak and well, sounds like also... Susie carmichael like, <laughs> it's just a really really impactful character moment yeah there's also a lot of this so there's the cgi mouths and and you know it's technology that's gotten a lot better um at the time but it was groundbreaking for the time but it still looks great but there's also some like mm. fucking phenomenal animatronics um being used mm. It seamlessly yeah, with Henson, like real pigs and yeah, it's great. The Jim Henson company was on this, wasn't it? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, uh, but yeah, so uh, we'll talk about. It. So yeah, the Chris Noonan directed this film, but didn't direct the sequel. Um, George Miller took over, and there was supposedly some bad blood between them. Um, James Cromwell, as recently as like 2020, has talked about how um, yeah, how they clashed quite a bit on set. Some quotes about it. Uh, Noonan said, look, I don't want to make a lifelong enemy out of George Miller, but I thought that he tried to take credit for Babe, tried to exclude me from any credit, and it made me very insecure. It was like your guru has told you that you are no good, and that is and that is really disconcerting. Uh, George Miller mm. later replied in the trades, being like, Chris said something that is defamatory, that I took his name off the credits on internet sites, which is absolutely untrue. You know, I'm sorry, but I really have a lot more to do with my life than to worry about that. When it comes to Babe, the vision was handed to Chris on a plate. Interesting stuff. Inter- very interesting stuff. Because, like... I I am growing very very fond of George Miller mm. as a director, despite only having seen that handful of films. But like watching what we're about to talk about, Babe Pig in the City, just like I don't, I think he's such a pro. Mm. And Babe One is the movie it needs to be. Um, and maybe that's because George Miller wasn't directing it because once he got his hands on this, the franchise for the sequel, I think we get maybe one of the most interesting to talk about sequels we've ever covered <laughs> on this show. 
you know yeah uh well we do have uh, one little bit to get to before we move on i'm not talking about franchise mm-hmm. that the segment's been all but abandoned i'm talking about <laughs> uh intern rachel and their list of differences from the mm-hmm. book to the movie so let me hear it the one of the sort of primary things the film opens with uh, babe's kind of backstory and the original farm that he gets taken from none of that's in the book um Mm-hmm. the rex the dog ferdinand duchess the cow and the horse are not in the book the book actually specifically says the farm hasn't had horses for a long time um, but i guess it's more cinematic to have a whole litany of animals um mm. there is rex isn't in the book yeah that's a he's a massive that's the the male sheepdog yeah, right? voiced like by he's a Hugo massive Weaving. part of the story yeah 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 um yeah there's uh hoggett grows protective of babe pretty quickly and um yeah it's sort of their their kinship's a lot a little bit faster in in the book um uh yeah so interesting like i talked about how um i love how babe uh, gets his way in the sheepdog trials by uh, Mm -hmm. being polite but in the movie he he originally tries to bark um, at them and then learns that you know there's a better way around this in the book he's only ever polite so that that was um added as like an arc i guess um interestingly um well it's like the paddington thing right where he's it's a a character has a non-arc because because babe goes into the story being like i'm just gonna be polite because that's who i am yeah. then the dogs go no you have to be rough so he tries have if to it doesn't work goes back to being yeah goes back to being polite and it's actually a story about how like the character's journey is far less compared to like the lesson that the main character teaches those around him i guess mm. the so, so there's um you mentioned about the, the rex being missing as well so in the book it's fly the female who wanted to win the trials but was never able to in the movie rex is like a two-time champion um uh. and yeah the, there's like the drowned sheep the hearing loss all of that none of that's in the book that was all for the movie mm. um it's great stuff. The movie sounds way better than the book. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, what yeah. I'm getting from this. <laughs> yeah. And also, I uh, mentioned the pa- what's the password for the sheep? Baramu. Yeah. Baramu. Which I never understood till this watch, because I'd heard that before, mm. is bar, the noise of sheep. I got that bit. Yeah. Then ram you. Yeah. Never re- never, never separated the, the, the made up bullshit word enough in my mind before to realize it's bar ram you spirit sheeps be true some something or other do you have it in front of you <laughs> no it's so, so interesting so you're saying bar ram you but i just want you to take it one step further and clarify what your realization is oh that rams and ewes are animals yeah right yeah, yeah. male and female sheep i just thought i just thought it was like Woo, spooky! Because when you said you it, know, I, I thought language. I thought your realization was that it's like bar meaning sheep. They're gonna ram you, like they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> no. knock you down. I thought that was your big realization just then, the way you said it. No, I, I think I when I was a kid and heard it, I just thought it was like made up sheep gibberish. Yeah, yeah. Bar ram you, right? But mm. yeah, but, but the, the, what's the full password? Do you have it? Oh, sorry, I thought you were reading about to read it. <laughs> I was about to read the one from the book. Oh, yeah. What's the one in the book? Um, yeah. So in the book, the password is, I may be you, I may be ram, I may be mutton, may be lamb, but on the hoof or on the hook, I baint so stupid as I look. And Rachel has clarified, no, baint is not a typo. What? Um, is it because B A is the first two letters of bar? Is yeah, it must be. The, I bang the, so that's oh, okay. Okay, bang. Yeah, all right. Okay, if you pronounce it right, it okay. sounds good. If you, not, you... it just sounds like the most like far reached, like like yeah, yeah, grasping yeah. at straws kind of pun. Yeah. Uh, so as always, I'll, I will ask Rachel to pop this whole list of uh, comparisons in the discord so you can check out uh, all the ones that i skimmed over there or if you enjoyed Mm. the ones i read so much you want to read them for yourself you can also do that 
<laughs> so yeah, 1998, George Miller brought us Babe, A Pig in the City. And what do you think it has on Rotten Tomatoes, AJ? So I have a really distinct memory of when we did Happy Feet 2, right? Wow, well, yeah, with Annabelle. Um, I remember s- with Annabelle we King. We were all sitting on the couch um, together. I rem- yeah, it was a great time. Yeah, um, I distinctly remember it. I... <laughs> do you want me to finish? Do you want me to <laughs> I remember talking about like that we were sleeping on George Miller as a voice for our podcast because we were a podcast that dissected sequels and George Miller's sequels were always uh, really interesting or well received. Like he seemed to understand how to do a sequel in a way that nobody else really did. And I remember at the time looking at Babe Pig in the City and seeing it had a high Rotten Tomato score and therefore I was justified in saying (laughs) he makes good sequels. That's all I know. But I reckon it's not as high as Babe 1. I reckon it's like maybe high 70s. It is 65 Okay, that's a lot lower than than what I thought. Uh, yeah, yeah. Never so mind. Ma- Fuck him. Maybe you Fuck don't. George maybe Miller. you don't remember it all shit. that well. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Yeah. This is this is a famous uh, box office flop, uh, critical disaster. Like sixty five is relatively high for the way people talk about this film, sort of thing. Uh, it made. Oh, 60- that is not how I've come to know it as e- at all. Interesting. Yeah. No. Okay. I mean, yeah. It's it's people um, hate this film. Uh, uh, so it made $69 million on a $90 million budget uh, between this and the equally expensive Meet Joe Black, which also came out in 1998. Uh, the then head of Universal, Casey Silver, resigned um, because of this. Um, <laughs> the, the, where is it? Ron Meyer in 2011, who was the president and chief operating officer of Universal's, uh, told an audience in Savannah, Uh, at film festival that babe pig in the city was one of the two worst movies universal has ever made uh the other one he singled out was the wolfman Mm. interesting i guess i'm guessing he wasn't talking about the like universal classic the wolfman surely he's not disparaging one of his like companies Um, i know that Um, you enjoyed this film and you're not alone in that and i will i will once you've given us the plot i will uh tell you who, who you have who, who's in your company with liking this film mm. okay so this movie uh is about um babe accidentally uh basically the farm farmer hogger gets injured and it's more or less babe's fault in a scene which it's, a, it's start- an insane opening to the film oh my, it started i was like oh my god they're going to kill off James Cromwell in the most fucking I Looney like, Tunes the- ass way. Like, yeah. So, so yeah, he's he's like trying to get down a well, and then Babe falls in, and they have like a seesaw situation where so the counterweight and uh, yada yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was going to kill him, and yeah. I was like, Jesus Christ, that's so dark. Yeah, like what a like this wonderful first film, and then start of the second one, you kill off Oscar nominated performance. Uh, yeah. I mean, to be fair, he's not in the film that much yeah. though. Um, yeah. compare compared to the first one, um, but uh, yeah. So they, what is the story engine? They're it's like because he's injured on, their, on the farm. The bank has come to foreclose on the farm, and the only way to save it is to is for Babe to 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 go to the to a sheepdog competition. Yeah, it's, in the it's, city, there's like or? an appearance fee. Um, but it's interesting mm. because the city they need to go to, like they need to go to, quote unquote, the city. But they mm. never get there, don't they? No, cause, no, because they're they're um connecting flight. Um, they don't make their connecting flight because the they drug don't dog, make it to the city. Yeah, yes, they, it's it's Bay Pig in a city, but it's not the intended city. city. Yeah, so so the drug dog voiced by Wallace Shawn. So so the it's farmer's not, wife. Not pl- no, it's uh, it, Billy Crystal. It's not Billy Crystal, but it sounds a lot like Billy Crystal. No, don't tell me, don't tell me, it's. It's not Billy Crystal. Who is it? No, no, like, like it's someone doing a Billy Crystal impression. It's like his name's like Bill Caval- C- Casavelli or something. Um, but it's it. I I checked it as well because it sounds like Mike Wazowski, but it's not Billy Crystal. Ah. Well, anyway, um, 
the, this drug dog to, to show that when he barks the humans come running in the airport he barks around babe and they end up him and babe and the farmer's wife get detained in some other city where they have to shack up in a hotel babe gets kidnapped makes friends with a bunch of other crazy animals in this hotel it all culminates in a big showdown where they win the money and and save save the farm um I think the plot is the least interesting and also the least good element Mm. of this film. It's the least impressive because what is impressive is much in the way that The Road Warrior, Beyond Thunderdome, Fury Road are all like catastrophically different movies to the to their predecessors respectively, right? Like, Like I remember talking about this on the Mad Max episode that George Miller cracked that the way to make a good sequel is to make a sequel that is unrecognizable to the first one. Mm. A sequel that cannot be compared. It does not invite comparison. And I was genuinely expecting like Ace Ventura 2, where instead of in the city, now it's in the wild. I was thinking, it's the same thing, but instead of in the farm, now he's in the city. It's Babe, Pig in the City. Pig in the City, as a sequel subtitle, I feel has become one of these like generic shorthands for like a sequel that's got a gimmick. You yeah. know, this one's got a gimmick. But this movie is closer to poor things than it is to Babe One, I thought. The The aesthetic of the city's not dissimilar, yeah. Yeah, the aesthetic of this, it looks like Batman Returns almost. Mm. Like, it is so imaginative and there's this it's, it starts out and it feels like a sequel to babe it's all set on the farm then when they go to the city it starts to get a little bit more um eclectic and then there's this fa- this really uh, what i'm assuming is a really famous shot from babe pig in the city i actually hadn't seen it before mm. um and i put it on our instagram as the the we share photos of the movies we're watching to our instagram where babe looks out the window of this hotel and it slowly pans through pans past his head to show the skyline of the city and it is every city you can think of there is the whole I, I, I read it out yeah there so is, you've got the yep. it, it's it's an island similar to manhattan uh, that it takes place on but uh it's got the world trade center the sears tower the chrysler builder the empire state building all of those are in new york so it's not that surprising uh the ids center the met life building the sydney opera house the hollywood sign the golden gate bridge uh the Furnace in Berlin, Big Ben, St. Basil's Cathedral of Moscow's Red Square, the Statue of Liberty, the Eiffel Tower, and the Christ the Redeemer statue, among others. And as um, a piece of dumb IMDb trivia points out, uh, a, helipl- a helicopter and an airplane can be seen eerily close to the Twin Towers, uh, although flying away from them. <laughs> yeah, because it's never before had a, a image of the sky around the yeah, twin towers. Had a plane in it. Yeah. <laughs> What's an airplane doing there? Yeah. Um. So this moment happens, and I was like, "Oh, okay. This is a George Miller He's film. In the city. Like this is <laughs> this has got the same like world building um, nuances that made Fury Road so good. I thought, and the aesthetic, like 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 it looks like those I Spy books mm. where they, that guy would take like photos of these tableaus yeah, of and you have to spot different things, like a more elegant Where's Wally kind of situation. Mm. Um, it, that this movie. It, it, another movie it reminded me of was David Lynch's Dune. Like, everything in it is so from, like, a mind. It's not just... The first one's a storybook. Mm. This is a toy a box. A picture book. You know, this is... Yeah, yeah. And, um, like, like at the end of the film, the climax of the film is um, the lady from Kath and Kim, whose name I can't pronounce. What's her name? Magda Sabansky. Magda Mega Sabansky. She was the uh, the spokesperson for Jetstar when it began. If you remember that, <laughs> no, don't. Uh, low cost awesome. airline. Actually, in now that you've said the it, let's fly Now that you've said it, I'm, yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh my god, that was they it. like went um, all in on that when yeah, New Zealand's yeah, low cost yeah, airline, yeah, yeah. Uh, New Zealand and Australia when it started, she was fucking everywhere. I haven't thought about that in decades. Holy <laughs> shit. Um. But the climax is at this, I think it's at the place where they're trying to show off Babe. Mm. And 
she gets in like this giant jolly no she's in a um clown suit for context plot context reasons mm. and she like connects to like this strap on the roof and essentially like bungee jumps across this room trying to like chase the the people who are stealing babe or whatever's whatever boring plot that's completely mm. overshadowed by the Animal like control rich and interesting there you go. The rich and interesting, like visual m- filmmaking at play, and Richard, it's Thunderdome. We're mm. watching Thunderdome, but with a clown instead of like a pseudo sexual dominatrix guy, right? Like it's <laughs> it's 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 the filmmaking language. Like I always thought the joke was that, like, do you know the director of Mad Max also directed Babe, Pig in the City, and mm. it's like, what? Those movies are so different. They're not. They're <laughs> really similar movies. Like, like it is. It is. There is a way to make this movie that I feel is what everyone who didn't like it is describing this like boring gimmicky um unnecessary sequel that like tarnishes the legacy of this this like beautiful first film i gave this five stars as well Mm. because i just thought it was so unexpectedly weird um the 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 hotel that babe is staying in is like dominated by monkey there's monkeys in this one Mm. i think one of them is voiced by dennis leary like they they there's like Steve, is, Steve, is the Stephen main Wright. one it's Stephen Wright it's totally Stephen Wright yeah like there's just so much go- they have babies and babe has to save the monkey babies and there's this like angry orangutan whose heart is won over like there's this bit where um he saves a pit bull from drowning mm. in what looks like the most animals were harmed in the making of this film thing Absolutely. I've ever seen. Th- this this pit bull is like hung from like its foot and dipped in in, in this what looks like it's like maybe Amsterdam yeah, it's river, like, like but obviously Venice, sort of yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's just there. And we get like, what made me think it was real is that there is a shot of the animals watching this happening while the pit bull itself is out of focus in the foreground. And you can see much as the way with all the animals and babe you can see just as uncensored genitals like right there mm. in front of the screen yeah. and i had this moment where i was like either this is a real dog that they are dipping its head in water for the sake of the shot or the puppet or whatever it is has hyper realistic out of focus genitals right in front of the camera right and it must be that one it must be the second thing and babe saves this pit bull and the pit bull's like now whatever the pig says goes and of course babe being a little sweetheart Take the pig <laughs> the ba- babe essentially like creates harmony for a, f- a brief uh moment in the film between all the animals and they all start singing if i had words Mm -hmm. Uh, like that and it's beautiful it's genuine genuinely i was like this is so lovely and beautiful and gorgeous and and it breaks my heart to think that this was so trashed on by Mm -hmm. critics because watching it now it's like it's one of these things which comes up a lot i think especially with auteur driven critical flops when you watch them now now that we're mm, in a sea like of films. something like ufomo <laughs> that wasn't a critical flop didn't have enough film <laughs> enough people watching it to be a critical flop that's not all it turns out most viewed <laughs> <laughs> um, but like like it's it's the, you know now now like oh do I want to go see Godzilla X Kong the new emperor empire or like whatever Marvel bullshit like these samey blockbusters the most expensive TV shows in the world no one's watching them mm. right no one's watching Lord of the Rings no one's cares about the Mandalorian anymore right like now we look back to the likes of like Batman and Robin and we're like ah, at least it was doing something mm-hmm. at least it like had style and flair and genuinely that's how i feel i think people just didn't get it i don't think people were had had an appetite for weird fucking movies Mm. in 1998 and now i think they do and i think that this film i don't think the story is like amazing whereas that's kind of the best part of the Mm. first babe but the everything else in babe pig in the city so weird and so visionary and so interesting and i had a fucking great time watching it (laughs) uh yeah i mean i didn't like it as much as the original i don't think it was the one of the two worst films universal has ever made but it's like Mm. though the thing that i alluded to earlier is that like my even though this 
goes bigger with the animals like there's a bit where there's this adorable little kitten who keeps saying that it's hungry and i just broke my little heart i can stand watching that but also one thing and i can say this now um, i couldn't have said this last week last episode when we had matt stewart on but i fucking hate um like chimpanzees in movies um (laughs) like when when it's actual monkeys or chimps or whatever being made to act out real things I, like i i hate it i i've i've never enjoyed it um uh, i don't think it's funny that like oh look it's acting like a human but it's an ape or whatever um and then having gotten older now the like ethics side of it uh i find even more off-putting and so well I sh- we should point out there is a very explicit no animals were harmed in the making mm. of this film message in the credits i know it says like any scene depicting injury was done with yeah, staging yeah. and puppets um and i think that's that's especially with what i was saying about the pit bull before mm. and i think like that i don't i don't know how how you know do we just take that at face value and think that the chips were treated fine i don't know well that's Maybe. the thing i mean like i i, I just think it's exploitative and i just I, I just don't enjoy watching it. There's like the little capuchin monkey, Crystal, who's Annie's boobs from Community, was Dexter mm. in um, Night at the Museum, like, and and was in um, Hangover. That like I kind of I get Crystal, like uh, I I understand the appeal, and um, she seems to have had a good life. But I don't know. Yeah, there's just something like they just always look sad, no matter what they're doing. Um, they look, there was a TV show that used to be on, I think it was like a five minute interstitial type thing, but it was like monkeys running a hospital and I hated it. Like even in this, because, because they can do so much more than a pig because you can, they can be trained and, um, do something. They can wear little human clothes and stuff. Um, Hmm. they're, they're made to do a lot more. Like you can get a pig or a dog or a, whatever to be like okay run here and stop and we will animate your mouth but the monkey is made to do so much more and it just has the sad look on its face the whole time and it makes me sad i just i just don't like watching it i don't find it funny and also ethically i don't agree with it i think there couldn't have been a funnier time in the podcast for you to take this moral stance against using chimpanzees and monkeys in movies then one episode after we guest starred on a podcast specifically about (laughs) (laughs) primates and popular culture um i also think it's funny and maybe worth exploring this that um you, you we, oh, this is an episode where the both of us have like questioned our own integrity when it comes to like ethical consumption of animals mm. right like we're both saying like we've got no excuse we don't we don't know what to say we're sorry like we we would like to we would i imagine we both feel the same that we would both like to see us become like plant-based consumers by the end of our lives right i know i would anyway yeah. like i would like to be a vegan at some point in my life um all of that, and then you're like, but I fucking hate the monkeys. God, I couldn't <laughs> give a shit. Like, and I know you're saying it's because it's exploitative, but maybe it's also because, like, they are the closest to humans, which both of us hate. We both hate humans. Everyone hates mm. humans, you know? So you'll, you'll see the closer they get to humans, the less sympathetic you get. <laughs> and the less, the less, like, like with, um, like, I'm sure there would have been cases on Babe 1 where, like, the duck wasn't treated particularly well or, you know, just, just in the nature of how these things work. But, like, we still enjoy it because it's a cute little animal. But the monkey is so close to looking like a human that first thing you do is go, I hate this compared to the other animals. And then because you hate it, you're less attached. And that allows you to consider the exploitation <laughs> aspect. Well, I of think it it, it's part of it is that, like, watching, like, a modern, you know, like, I love planet of the apes um for instance because that is all cg and it's and they emote a lot more than real Mm, because mm, you can't ask a monkey to to, oh you need a smile give it you know give me a 10 percent sadder in this scene um Mm. but you have like in babe you can tell in the original i'm talking about you can tell when it's an animatronic um you can tell when it's a cgi mouth you can tell all these things and maybe it's even because it's better in the second one the, you know the technology is just that one step better that there is less of i i i know just in my mind the technology is not good enough that 
there was no animals near the scene of a drowning. You know, mm. I, I I can tell mm. that there are some real animals involved in certain scenes, um, whereas you not mm. can't necessarily know that for certain today. Um, that it just it, I, I was a lot more uncomfortable watching watching this one, um, mm. mainly because the monkeys make me sad. No, I mean, fair enough. I I think that this did play into one of the highlights of the film, though, which is when they get captured by animal control. Um, the orangutan, who's like Scottish, who's the orangutan played by? Because that's a, he's like the disapproving one that that doesn't like Babe till the end of the uh, film. James Cosmo. He, okay, not a not a name I recognise. I keep expecting celebrity guest voices, but it's never one of them. <laughs> um, uh, so he he's like disapproving of Babe the whole film. He's the one who's like, you can't let other animals into the hotel because there won't be enough to go around. And Babe sort of teaches them all um, socialism. <laughs> and, and it turns out that everyone can have a jelly bean if it's all, um, you know, if it's all divvied out properly. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they get captured by animal control, they're like planning their breakout and they turn to the orangutan. They're like, you ready? And he, it's, it's shot from like down the hall. He's in like the secluded part of his by himself and he's putting on his clothing that he's been wearing the whole movie and he just says please wait i'm not dressed and he slowly gets dressed and they wait for him and he goes thank you for waiting and it was just this that was that tugged at my heartstrings because it's like this is a character who has gone this whole movie has been like the king of his little pile of dirt right like he's been at the top of it and now he's just like you know, now he's just a, a peasant, and it's like it's like he's saying, "Allow me to keep my dignity. Mm. Allow me to get dressed before we go." I thought that was really, really well done. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I like I didn't dislike the film, but I much preferred the first one. But you are not alone, AJ, in your feelings uh, for this mm. film. Uh, the two most famous film critics of all time, uh, Siskel and Ebert, both loved this film. Uh, Roger Ebert no gave kidding. the film four out of four stars and said it was even better than the original. Uh, a quote mm. here saying babe was a movie where everything led up to the big sheep herding contest babe pig in the city is not so plot bound although it has the required assortment of villains chases and close calls it is more of a wonderment lolling in its uh enchanting images original delightful and funny he concluded i liked babe for all the usual reasons but i like babe pig in the city more and not for any of the usual re- reasons because here is a movie utterly bereft of usual reasons i love that and that's exactly how i yeah. feel uh but i will say not very ebertian to like a weird movie like mm-hmm. when i was on do go on the other week talking about 1984's June again the David Lynch one like Ebert fucking hates <laughs> that mm. movie like anything like I feel like a common trend if you look back at a lot of Ebert stuff if the movie if, regardless of if we think the movie's good or bad he really he really preferred traditional films over mm anything too expressionist i felt yeah um, uh, uh, but yeah uh but yeah and gene siskel uh put it as his favorite movie of 1998 and it was his last ever favorite movie of the year because he died a couple of months into 1999 oh my god this is the movie so so good it killed uh yeah what's siskel's first name gene gene yeah <laughs> uh it's like a reverse um now nah, the host the host fuck you <laughs> Sorry, on, I the, on the Zoom saying, delay, I said the host before before you said don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always want to say I am number four, and I was like, in my head, I was like, nope, it's not that one, it's the other one with the fucking blue eyes. What What are you talking about? Just to oh, tell yeah, people the, the who last, don't know this The last reference. film that uh, Roger Ebert uh, reviewed and hated it so much that he died. Uh, but mm. another, fa- another fan of Babe Pig in the City, are you familiar with uh, Tom Waits? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's a big fan of the film. Uh, in a 2010 interview, uh, he said, I'm not going to do his voice because it'll tear up my throat, but he said, uh, you know what one of my favorite movies of all time is? And if I'm at home with my kids and say, what do you want to see? The big joke is, oh, dad, not Pig in the City, but I love that movie. I'd see that anytime. This is great. This is a great movie. And critics... And if, like, of course, like Tom Waits is a lot more of your like weird fucking weird guy that would like this movie for being weird but the, but the, like i feel like 
I, I, I'm able, I'm self-aware enough that I can stand back and I can go, I understand why this wouldn't have been for everyone. It's not what they expected. It's not what they probably bought a ticket for. But I'm just, I, I feel like this position that I'm in of like appreciating strange auteur driven messes i feel like we are just going to be- find more and more reverence for those kinds of films yeah, as sure. we continue into blockbuster banality you know like yeah. as it all homogenizes into until the same film is just released 20 times a year mm-hmm. you know like this is going to films like this are going to be what we will crave and what we missed look at look at we've we've you know look at what is getting nominated for for best picture these days it is the weird it is the the strange it's, it's your maestros because, it's your yeah <laughs> your belfast <laughs> no, but, you know like like poor things barbie like um um everything everywhere all at once these are all like movies that like go <laughs> they're chick flicks <laughs> <laughs> they, they go they go against the grain in such a commanding way that i think even the most um brand serial tastes are starting to appreciate you know even if your favorite movie is like transformers i think that movies like poor things or babe pick in the city are starting to to demonstrate their value in a much more obvious way Hmm. well i disagree but we'll move on um (laughs) no i don't anyway the we talked about titles briefly at the top but um worth mentioning the original title for this film was uh babe in metropolis uh, and there's some signs up throughout the film that it's implied that that's the name of the city that he's in mm, interesting uh, yeah what do you think of that babe pig in the city's pig in the city's a better title yeah it's yeah it's just one of those classics mm. it's like scooby-doo 2 monsters unleashed which um just rolls off the tongue which james gunn recently said he didn't want to call it that he just wanted to call it scooby-doo unleashed but no you, what's interesting the about that is that the movie is specifically about the monsters being unleashed mm. like unambiguously like the title wasn't just like a it's not just like scooby-doo reloaded mm. oh, it's I, like, I will say no, though, it's, it's referring to something that happens in the film having that like you want a scooby-doo this time it's bigger and better in one word unleashed is a good dog pun now that i think about it that's true i didn't even think of that yeah. and is that the intention with monsters unleashed to begin i guess with? it's one of those things that you and i always do on, our, pri- on our private chat where this is crazy <laughs> is this not a crazy I revelation think that monsters that unleashed, Scooby-Doo unleashed is a dog pun that i think scooby-doo unleashed is a great dog pun but yeah the joke that you and i love to make is monsters unleashed is now too removed from the pun so it doesn't work anymore (laughs) yeah 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 well at least it took me 25 years to realize it was even well however old scooby-doo 20 just 20 years isn't it to realize that it even was like possibly even um referring to that wow and you heard it here it, first. It makes folks. you think. It does make you think, doesn't it? Uh, well, anyway, a couple of siggies we've got to get through. Uh, we've got a ranked mm-hmm. at franchise. Uh, head over to letterbox.com and, you know, mm-hmm. so on. We've got a we've got a list of all the franchises we've ever done, and we rank them. We also, Richard, typically do something called a gold star for when we think there is no obvious weak point in a franchise. It it sometimes gets conflated with all of them are as good as each other, which I don't think is entirely correct. I think it just means there's like no obvious bad one, mm. and it's a little bit different with two film franchises because I feel like it's like less impressive if there's two good films in a row. And I will also concede that clearly the critical consensus is not with me enough to give Babe a gold star franchise. But I will say, I will say that even if it was well received um, at the time, I do think that there is a, a bespoke difference with what I, with my feelings for how good the Babe films are compared to like how good the Before trilogy is, oh, right? Where yeah. Babe Babe is a series, I think, where it's for me anyway. It's a case of two really good movies, but cohesiveness mm. is the cohesiveness isn't there at all. Shout so the, I actually the don't think window. this is. <laughs> I actually don't think this is a good franchise just on okay. paper. 
I okay, think, do you think it's too really, really strong. Films. Do you think it's better than um, Phantasm? Yeah. Okay. Do you think it's better than Pop Star? Yeah. Okay. You need to jump up a few. Okay, <laughs> Let's get right. into the. It's I. I reckon we're above Nymphomaniac cons, and I don't think we'd get any too much any any like pushback for that. Is it better than Frozen? I guess now we're getting into a matter of taste, aren't we? Mm. Because I would say Babe is a better movie than Frozen and Frozen Two, right? I'd say Babe Pick of the City is better than. Frozen okay. Well, here, here's the real know? question: Is it better than Happy Feet? Yeah, I think it's better than Happy Feet. Okay. Uh, what do you think? I, I don't have any thoughts. Uh, is it better than... <laughs> trying to find our next um, two film. Uh, is it better than Kill Bill? Let's put it... What's, been, what's below Kill Bill? Fast and the Furious. I I reckon it's between Fast and Furious and Kill Bill, maybe. <laughs> okay. uh, that is our, I don't know. Like, what? It's our new what do you 36. think? I'm genuinely curious because I, 36 is lower it, than what I was playing. I would have put it lower than Phantasm. Really? No, I'm being a silly goofball. No, I don't care. I feel like Kill Bill gets the edge because it has the like cohesiveness that the Babe franchise. Well, it's also doesn't. arguably only but one also, movie. Um, what about is yeah, it better yeah. than Monsters but Inc? But then, then is see now this is what I'm saying is like now go above Kill Bill. What's what's one above Kill Bill? Evil Dead. Very similar franchise to to well at least Sam Raimi and George Miller are similar yeah, directors. Yeah, yeah, they are. I think. Um, and then above yeah no I'm let's. Yeah. What? No, get you go. I, uh, I'm always keen to stay in the ranking segment for as long <laughs> as possible. Above that is Casino Royale. Above that is Mad Max. No, okay. I think we're below. We're one below Kill Bill. At okay, cool. I think 36. that's a good place for that. All right, and uh, now we've got to continue the franchise. AJ, do you have a continuation of the franchise? Where would you like to see the Babe franchise go? Well, first of all, I would like to acknowledge how. Um, I don't know if there's been a duology ever less that's asking less for a third entry than than the Babe series. Like this just feels so complete, and it doesn't need anything more. Um, whereas, like I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that about other two film franchises such as Kill Bill or Monsters Inc. The two you <laughs> mentioned that are in front of mind right now. Um, but here is my sequel pitch. And it, it goes back to the origins of the podcast and even a little bit earlier, Richard, to the Muppet Show. Let's get Babe Pigs in Space! <laughs> For a few reasons. One, because I liked the pigs in space and that it, it sounds like pig in the city. It sounds mm. like where you'd go next, right? Um, and also, classic Cole Popsha joke doing in space sequels. On top of that, as ridiculous as it might sound off the bat, I don't think it's that out of the question that Babe would find himself at Cape Canaveral or something and have some I, kind of like... I think that's like, completely out of the question. <laughs> you, you, I, I think after Pig in the City, Babe can do anything now. <laughs> after Babe going to the go city, to the where else is there to go? <laughs> Space! <laughs> that's what I'm saying. And I, I think like, like Babe, Pig in the City establishes that this is like a... a this um, is a pig who will melodr- go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> this is a melodramatic universe in which the films are yeah, set. Yeah, sure. And perhaps perhaps it's done like from the perspective of the the animals. Perhaps the point is like a farm is so quaint and traditional and that's all they know. And when they go to the city, it's just sim- stimulation overload and they the way they comprehend it is in this like gothic uh, kind of like, um, you know, comic book mm. classic kind of way. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's like an architectural style. Postmodernism. No, like there's there's a um, it's the big one. What's the big architectural style? Uh, architecture. Do you want me to ask Jess studied architecture for you? Jess. Yeah. What's the big architectural style? What's the big architectural style? Like the big one, you know. <laughs> this art she deco, said art deco she said postmodernism. <laughs> Tell her I was thinking of art he was deco. Of art deco. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I heard that. She she agrees. That's one of the big ones. <laughs> um, there, yeah, there's a, there's an Art Deco style to the city that the pig is in, yeah. and I guess like knowing how ridiculous that movie allows itself to get. I could see a brave little toaster goes to Mars situation right, yeah, okay. happen for the, for Babe, you know. Yeah, I want to see, thank you for that, AJ. I want to see. Mm. Uh, I I was thinking that like Babe, kind of lends itself due to the time period and the the subject matter to like a cartoon series, and you could just have mm. the adventures of the farm. You could keep the same voice actor, even and yeah, it's a it's like a sheep uh, a sheep pig the series would be called babe the sheep mm-hmm. pig and it'll be like yo all these crazy mm. adventures it gets into but then the the thing that i would really want to see is this imaginary tv series and then cross it over so that you have a reason to bring back a beloved beloved show from my childhood mm. sheep in the big city sheep in the big city this is I'm so glad we share this because I feel like I don't know anyone else who yeah. knows, except maybe my younger sibling who knows Sheep in the Big City. Genuine to this day, the fun one of the funniest kids cartoons ever yeah, made. It's incredible. Like, it is so funny. I think it's, it's so like funny. all on YouTube or a lot of it's on YouTube. It's it's fucking fantastic. Um It's from like two thousand five. It's so self aware. It feels like a predecessor to like the meta sense of humor that dominated in years past right like it, it was it was like full of like fictional ads that would play mm. in between the sections and the and narrator was like an show. active character in it um but he was like yeah, yeah, the yeah, narrator yeah, yeah. and it would just cut to his recording booth and then and yeah 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 and the, the bad guy was was an army general named general specific and his sidekick was private public oh, yeah and the, they had this ma- they had this crazy like frankenstein scientist who was not a mad scientist <laughs> he was an angry scientist yeah. they would go out of his way to clarify that whenever it came yeah up. and the reason they were show. going after him is because they had a sheep powered ray gun which is like just this giant ray gun with a sheep shaped hole cut out of it and so they had to try yeah. and capture the sheep so it could fit in. Do you, do you remember what happened in the se- there are two seasons? Do you remember what happened in the season one finale? I, of sheep of the big city. I, when you, I I do they, like they capture no they they, they get the narrator powered gun right. Yeah, so yeah. there's a narrator powered ray gun, yeah. and the narrator gets captured and put in the ray gun, and then it reveals who the true mastermind is, and the swivel chair turns around, and Sheep is the bad guy the whole time. <laughs> and then this was just promptly abandoned when season two started, <laughs> like it was just back to status quo. But like the f- first season ended with the reveal that Sheep in the big city was the bad guy, and the narrator was actually wanted for a narrator powered ray gun. God! So good, so funny, such a good show. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. We should do a, mm. a Sheep in the Big City rewatch podcast. Yeah, we'll call it AJ and Richard in the Big City with the Sheep in the Big City. <laughs> <laughs> Someone make a thumbnail for us. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyway, thank uh, you. yeah, we now have to reveal what our next two film franchise will be, AJ. Oh, and is this a, is this a franchise roulette? It is, situation? and I believe it's your time to make me guess if you want to. I will. I'll I'll pull up our, our franchise list. So if you've never heard the show before, <laughs> um, we I laugh because who the hell's listening who isn't already? Um, we choose the next franchise by randomly drawing. Um, from a list of franchises uh, this year we're only doing two film franchises so we'll draw a random number and that'll correspond to a franchise Richard give me a number 94 two film franchise 94 Richard is um oh okay this is a franchise which had a sort of distant it's a distant sequel situation Mm -hmm. um the first one quite a revered film and i believe the second one which i was really excited to see but i never saw it also isn't like poorly reviewed at all Mm. i think it was quite it it had quite good reviews um an adult very much more adult oriented than train spotting isn't it it's train spotting, train spotting, and T two train spotting. Uh, yeah, so that's what we'll do. What a cool franchise to get! I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Finally, an excuse to watch train spotting. Yeah, too. the oh most anticipated God. movie of 2016. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for listening, everybody. If you enjoyed this, 
Twitter, Instagram, we're all on there. We're also jump in the Discord if you want to tell us that you too have this you burning too? love for Bay Pig in the City. Ah, they're very nice. Um, and you can also donate to our Patreon over at patreon.com slash Popshire. If you wish to do so, you can get all sorts of things there, like exclusive uh, extra podcasts, and you get to tell us every, well, mm-hmm. suggest and vote on every second franchise we cover, um, and give us something I, to talk about after the music new, you're currently hearing ends. I just dropped a new yep. Dex tape on there. People have been listening along to that. Uh, where are you doing a, the, the segment dicks picks yet i didn't i forgot to do it last time and then i deliberately didn't do it this time <laughs> <laughs> fantastic i respect your creative vision <laughs> um yeah so check that out over at patreon.com slash and stay tuned after this music ends for the post credits scene thank you very much for listening i've been, i love talking about this this was such a fun franchise to get i just like the, spending time getting with to you, the trough so it doesn't matter what we're talking about Welcome along to the post credit scene. There's a segment at the end of each episode where if you donate $5 or more over at patreon.com slash Popsha, you get to give us something to talk about in this, the post credit scene. Richard, who's it from and what is it? Uh, today's post credit scene is one of many sent in by a bit more cheese uh, who sent a massive list to you about 18 months ago and then will be said, hey, we've run out of things. He came out of the woodwork and said, I sent in a bunch and you haven't used any of them. And then I was like, oh, what's this? And then he sent them to me about a month or two ago and then I forgot to put them on the list. Um, and But they're, they're on well, there the, now. The idea, it's not that... It's not that I forgot. It's that, like, I'm trying to space it's it out so that we're not just... give a shit. Answering the same person. No, these, these were never added to the list at all until I did. Ah, uh, okay. In, in sorry, but yeah. bit more cheese. I'm sorry. Yeah, you just, you just said, hey, um, why are you sending me a bunch of questions? I don't give a shit about you. Um... Those sort of things. Or anyway, your cheese. Yeah. If anything, there could be less cheese. <laughs> uh, so, Bibble Cheese says, Hey, Shaggers. Uh, it's been said that there is one sandwich you're still thinking about to this day. What's that dream sandwich? What's inside it? Where were you when you had it? And would you try to recreate that experience? Do you have a long answer for this question? Uh, I can adjust my length accordingly. I have quite a long, passionate, emotional answer for this question. Okay. But I I worry that two really long answers is too much. So do you... You go first. (laughs) Okay. When I was 18, 17, my family tried to move to Australia and I stayed in New Zealand to... Such a long context for the story. To finish off school. And the end of the story is that they... came back because it wasn't working out before we need to hear I all went this? over. I uh, just, just in case people <laughs> are like, well, did you go to Australia? Um, so I had to stay with this family from my church. Um, and they were the, the exact kind of people. They're not going to listen to this. So I'm sure they won't mind me saying this. They're the exact kind of people who probably shouldn't take in a angsty teenager who's mad at his parents and, and everything. I felt like, um, the mother of this family especially was very hands-on and I really needed hands-off um, like relationships in my life at that point, I think. But anyway, my the two months I stayed at this house are full of like just feeling really lonely and um, pressured and a lot of a lot of really dark memories. But the one thing I did get from this is my my parents for some reason never made me cook, and this woman made me cook. She taught me how to cook, and um, I rem- I have a formative memory of being seventeen and putting chicken in a frying pan and seeing it turn white after it got you know mm. hot from the pan and being like I've never done that before. <laughs> like I've never seen myself do that to chicken before um and they used to make me this sandwich and here's what i think the sandwich had from memory Mm -hmm. it was a piping hot toasted chia barter roll that was open so it was like a pocket not like two pieces Mm. cut in half more like open and they'd pulled some of the breading out and and so they could put stuff in there in the sandwich itself was piping hot chicken um raw capsicum and brie cheese that would just com- turn to cream from the heat of the chicken and the bread combined. It is to this day, Richard, and a bit more cheese, and friends of the Discord and, and the podcast listening, the best thing I've ever eaten. 
So delicious. Just so good. And and I can still remember the way all the flavors combined mm. into, into I remember sitting on an armchair, eating it, thinking about how miserable my life is and being like, but this sandwich kind of makes up for a lot of what's <laughs> going wrong in my life right now. Um, I, since then... You've made one for me. ...have tried to recreate it thousands of times. Me and my friend once, we named it the Allison Brie, but if you swapped chicken for steak, uh, it was the Brie Larson. Or no, it was the other way around. I think the Allison Brie was the steak and the Brie Larson was the chicken. Um, and I would start incorporating like relishes and chutneys, all sorts of new things. Now, don't get me wrong. I've made some pretty fucking awesome Brie <laughs> Larson sandwiches over the years. Like, they're great and I'm proud of them and they're delicious. I've never gotten it exactly right. It's like that Principal Skinner joke about the, could never get the spices right here in the States. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like, I'm making delicious chicken Brie sandwiches. They're great. But they're not. They're not what, and I, 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 I stay up at night wondering if I missed an ingredient, you know, if I've forgotten like a crucial part of the process, because I didn't make mm. these sandwiches; they made they, them well, for they me. Probably just need a bit more cheese. A bit more cheese. Also, funny to be like waxing lyrical about a chicken sandwich on an episode where we were talking about how like we are so desperate to become vegans, mm. we feel this d- distinct calling to give up eating meat and then the post credit scene i'm like i had an emotional experience with a chicken sandwich that i will never <laughs> get over yeah my my like two answers to this one is just like there's a sandwich shop um, in auckland now that i've taken you to and it's fucking incredible oh, great and place. it's like it's like so a good. deli new york deli sort of style um fucking incredible sandwiches there it's like it's quite out of my way to get there now but i'm willing to do it but the other one um i won't Place is called Pastrami on Rye for those. Pastrami and Rye. And Rye. Um, But the other thing, um, the closest sort of thing to what you said is that when I was in Scotland as a kid. In Scotland? Yes, you've told me this. I think you've said it on the podcast before, but it's a great story. Um, but it's it's one of these, like, I love asking people what the best thing they've ever eaten is because... I mean, it's very boring if if you're like, oh, you know, just this restaurant that I go to, I love it. Like the best answers are like the specific thing your mum made, um, like a something like that where it's like I've never been able to replicate it, or a restaurant that you could never find again in a million years. And my example is one of those. It's like we were in Scotland, and I was I would have been nine, and it was like. An alleyway, off an alleyway, off an alleyway. We found this little tiny hole in the wall in the middle of nowhere. Um, me and my sister got bacon baps. So like a bap, you know, being the type of a roll. And it was just like, just bacon. Straight. I'm, I'm pretty sure. This maybe is the funniest story to be telling on the baby. Episode. I know, I know. <laughs> but then, and my mum got um, mac and cheese. Uh, I can't remember what my dad got if, or if, if he got anything. But all three of us were like this is the best thing I've ever had in my life. And it was like one of those things where it was just such a simple, it was like literally just straight bacon. And like, I do, I fucking love a bap. Like, don't get me wrong. I love a bap, but um, yeah, it was, it would, it would never, I wouldn't even be able to tell you what city we were in. And then, you know, to narrow that there was, and it's, it's been over 20 years. <laughs> there is no way that place is still yeah. there. So I just couldn't, couldn't recreate it. 